throughout my history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where Good to be here with you in worship and those of you still coming in from the commons good to be here with you let's stand on our feet and sing praise to our god
of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven, you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to us. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me oh. to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, yeah. your history can prove, there's nothing you can do, you're faithful and true, though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast, and let my heart burn when you speak a word, it will come.
begin this morning in the name of our triune God, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We pray. Almighty and gracious God, Lord, we give you thanks for welcoming us into this place, Lord, for bringing us here to sing your praise, to hear your word, and to be reminded, Lord, of your faithfulness. That at all moments in our lives, Lord, in the highs and in the lows, that no matter how often we struggle to believe, Lord, you are faithful. God, I pray that you allow our hearts to rest in your faithfulness, to find hope in your faithfulness, in the promises that you have made, the promises that you have fulfilled, and the promises that are yet to come. God, we give you thanks for all these things, and we worship and praise you in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Savior. And all God's people agreed and said together, amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you all, and also with you. And you may be seated, uh, and at this time we'll dismiss for we worship. That's going to be a great lesson if you're in ages 3 to 8, head on out, and you better behave, okay? You want pastor coming to We Worship, all right? No, We Worship's going to be great. Uh, Mrs. Gass has a wonderful lesson planned for you this morning. It is going to be a great time. And for those of you uh, remaining here in worship, good morning. It's good to be here with you in worship. I'm Nicholas Gonzalez, the associate pastor here at St. Andrew, and I'm so thankful for this chance to worship with you. And if you're here with us for the first time this morning, welcome. Uh, so thankful that you're here. Would love for you to fill out the Connect card located in the pew back in front of you. Uh, this gives us a chance to connect with you and then to connect you to the family of faith here at St. Andrew. Also, if you're joining us on our live stream, good morning. Uh, so thankful that you're here. You can fill out a Connect card at mystandrew.org slash connect, and that will connect you to our online and in-person ministries as well. And as a reminder, if if you're ever unable to be with us on a Sunday morning, you can join us at our Monday evening worship service every Monday night, 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary, and Holy Communion is always served at that service. Uh, and just a few quick announcements for you as we get going. I uh, want to remind you that confirmation registration is underway. Uh, confirmation is essentially our uh, middle school youth group here at St. Andrew. So it's, it's students in grades 7 and 8, and they spend two years uh, studying the Bible together and Luther small catechism, and really to grow in the promises of their baptism and then their faith in God and their relationship with God so that at the end of those two years, they proclaim that faith uh, and the church surrounds them and lifts them up in our prayers. So be praying for that ministry as registration is happening, praying for the teachers and all those involved in that. And if you know someone in seventh or eighth grade, sign them up, uh, kind of like how we do with volunteers. Sign them up and then we'll call them, okay? You don't even have to tell them. We will get in touch with them. No, uh, we're so thankful for our confirmation ministry. And so uh, keep praying for that and uh, sign up at the table located in the comments. Also, on Sunday, August 28th, so two Sundays from now, we have our annual backpack blessing. Uh, so whether you're in elementary school, preschool, high school, even college, bring your backpacks on that Sunday, August 28th, and come forward for a blessing. That'll happen at all three services as we uh, prepare for the school year, which is just hard to believe that we are already there. Also, always a reminder, check your blue notes for everything going on. As the fall is coming upon us slowly but surely here, uh, ministry is picking up, things are happening. Uh, so you can check your blue notes and you can check our website, mystandrew.org, to stay up to date with everything happening here and the ministry that God does through all of you. In our prayers this morning, uh, we're giving thanks and celebrating the birth of Alexander Thaddeus Meyer, son of Tad and Lauren Meyer. Uh, he was born last week, and so lifting them up and thankful for a healthy birth and a healthy mom and all of uh, the joys of that. We're also giving thanks for the 65th wedding anniversary of Bill and Dorothy Fristo. Uh, they were in worship with us this morning, so giving thanks for that. Uh, also, uh, in our prayers and for the family and friends of our dear brother in Christ, Lauren Hellickson, uh, who received his eternal rest this past Wednesday. Uh, Lauren as you may remember a few weeks ago, celebrated his 99th birthday with us here in uh, worship. And so we give thanks for Lauren's life and his ministry here at St. Andrew. As Pastor Mark would say, sad for us, but great for him. So we lift the, Laura, the Hellickson family up in our prayers. And the service for Lauren will be this Thursday, August 18th at 1030 in the morning here at St. Andrew. Uh, there'll be a luncheon to follow as well as a procession to the Maryland Veterans Cemetery in Crownsville where the burial service will take place. So uh, lifting up the Hellickson family in our prayers as well and giving thanks uh, for his eternal rest in Christ. Also in our prayers, we are giving thanks for the installation of Bill Harmon who is the new district president of the Southeastern District. So our church body is a part of smaller uh, little districts geographically spread out throughout the country. Ours is the Southeastern District. Bill Harmon was installed yesterday down at a King of Glory Lutheran Church in Williamsburg, Virginia. 
I was there, uh, Pastor Yared was there, Pastor Mark was there, Pastor Bob was there, uh, but as you may have noticed, Pastor Mark and I ended up in going opposite directions. He went to the beach and I came back to here because I love all of you so much. Uh, no, he is off getting a wonderful vacation with Patty and the kids, so we're giving thanks for uh, his rest and looking forward to having him back next week. But uh, I am here and I'm so thankful to be here with you in worship today. And uh, our worship continues now with our lesson from God's Word, which comes from the letter of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, and is read to us this morning by Emma Lohr. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith our ancestors received approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the Word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land he had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, he received power of procreation even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one person, and this one as good as dead, descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. All of these died in faith without having received the promises but from a distance they saw and greeted them. They confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth, for people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land that they had left behind, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, Lord, we give you thanks for the gift of faith. The faith that, that brought us here this morning, the faith that woke us up, Lord. The faith that continues to grow in us through your son, Jesus. And all God's people agreed and said together, amen. Have you ever thought about the fact that everything that you do is essentially, in one way or another, an exercise in faith. And when I say faith, I'm not exactly talking about biblical faith, though we will talk about that this morning, but if you just take kind of the basic, generic, general, dictionary, Google definition of faith, everything you do is an exercise in faith. See, uh, here's what that definition says. If you Google faith, it says complete trust or confidence in someone or something. Uh, also, I, I thought you'd all appreciate this little note. So you know how when you, you look up something on Google, like a def definition or in a dictionary, and usually there's like a sentence that, to give you context of how to use this word in a sentence. Here is what, uh, when you Google faith, the, the dictionary sentence they give you for, for how to understand faith. This restores one's faith in politicians. <laughs> Let's just say they probably could have figured out a lot of different ways to apply that word. But nonetheless... If at the most basic definition, faith is complete trust or confidence in someone or something, it seems reasonable to say that every day people have faith in all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, just take, for example, what it took for me to wake up this morning. Uh, last night, I had to have faith that when I set my alarms, they were going to go off at the right time and they were going to ring at the, at the right volume to wake me up. And therefore, I also had to have faith that when I plugged in my phone, it was going to charge overnight so it would stay on. And of course, I also then had to have faith that my, my wires were all good and that they weren't going to malfunction or anything like that. And leading up to then, I had to have faith that the electricity was going to stay on all night long. 
And now when you plug your phone in tonight, you're not thinking about any of those things. You just assume it's all going to work. You, you have faith. It's all going to kind of come together. But how many of you have woken up in the morning and you look at your phone and it's not charged? Thankfully, it's never happened to me on a Saturday night yet. But I know that when I wake up in the morning and I look at my phone, if it hasn't charged overnight, my first thought is, oh, it's going to be that kind of day. Maybe I'll just stay in bed and we'll try again tomorrow, right? Because if we have faith, if we have complete trust or confidence in someone or something, it would seem that when I go to sleep at night, I have faith that all those little intricate things are going to happen in the same way and that I'm going to wake up and be here in the morning. But take even a more present example, like you being here in worship. And more specifically, the fact that without thinking about it, according to this simple definition... That when you sat down in your pew this morning, you had faith that it wasn't going to fall out from underneath you. Now, on the one hand, you, you had faith because you've sat in the pew before and it's never happened. But could you imagine if one day you came in and the pew broke while you sat? First of all, i got to be honest with you. I promise I would try not to laugh. Try, okay? I would try not to laugh. Uh, but, but if you think about it, if that's what happens, you have faith that the pew is not going to buckle because you've seen it happen, and so you kind of trust that. At the same time, some of you come in here every single week, no matter what time you get here, and you have faith that no one's going to be sitting in your pew, <laughs> right? You, you're believing, okay, people know I sit there, you have faith in that kind of little thing. And, and I could go on and on, but, but my point is this. That if the definition of faith as complete trust or confidence in someone or something is that simple, then it's not good enough for us as Christians. See, because uh, one of the things that is true about faith is that it is objective. Uh, Faith has to grab onto something. It has to grab hold of something. Maybe like uh, the sturdiness of a pew or the reliability of a charger. Uh, But for us as Christians, we have a very clear object of our faith. Right? Scripture talks about it and points it out all the time. Uh, The object of our faith is God. And that's revealed to us in Jesus. So a definition, a biblical definition of faith then, one that you and I have as Christians, is this. Dependence or trust in the biblical God as revealed in Jesus. Dependence or trust in the biblical God as revealed in Jesus. And here's how the writer of Hebrews would say that. In Hebrews 11 verse 1, He writes, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And so right away, when we read this verse, uh, we're given two applications of our faith. Uh, The first one being the assurance of things hoped for. And what that means for us then is, uh, when we have faith, we have assurance of present promises that exist, but also that we are always hoping for something more. Right, that that scripture points out that we experience the realities of God in our lives through Jesus right now, but we're always hoping for what is to come, for the new creation, for the promises of more that God has made to us. And so we have assurance and confidence right now and in what is to come. The second application then is this reality, this idea of conviction of things not seen. Essentially, it's believing in the evidence of what you cannot see. And usually when we talk about evidence and things that we can see or things that we can hold, and yet uh, none of us have ever seen God before, and yet uh, when we look around this room or when we look around creation, we see the work of God. We see evidence for God in the world and in our lives. And of course, uh, you can even take Jesus, his life and his death and his resurrection as evidence of God's faithfulness. Even historically speaking, uh, other religions acknowledge that Jesus was, uh, at the very least, uh, some a prophet. Some acknowledge that he was a person, right? So you have all these definitions, all these realities that uh, we have this evidence for Jesus. And so from our understanding of biblical faith, when you tell someone that you have faith, you are not just saying that it, uh, things happen out of occurrence or by chance, or that, uh, well, I guess it's possible that all these things happen, uh, because faith is conviction In the reality of promises made, promises fulfilled, and trusting in promises that are still yet to come. Uh, Martin Luther, uh, the theologian for which our church body is named, he once said this, Biblical faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure and certain that a man can stake his life on it a thousand times. So by that understanding... 
biblical faith is something that you are willing to put your life on the line for because you are so sure of it. And if you think about it, that, that's kind of the faith that the people in the Bible have. That they put their lives on the line for this faith. It's because faith in God is not just this concept, it's active. Right? In Hebrews, the, the writer also says that uh, faith in God is living and active. The word of God is living and active. So we are to live out our faith. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 11. See, as, as I was reading Hebrews 11 over the past few weeks, I actually found it really helpful to think about it like a receipt of faithfulness. Uh, so when you go to the store and you pay for something, you usually get a receipt. And that receipt is like a record. It tells you what you paid for, when you paid for it, the date. It even tells your name of your credit card number, all these little information things. But essentially, it is a receipt. It's a record keeper of all the things that you have. And when you read Hebrews 11, it's like a receipt of the faith that people had in God. Right? Uh, here's how it goes. We hear about all these different people and the ways in which they put their faith then into action. It starts uh, with Abel who offers a sacrifice more acceptable to God. And Noah builds an ark because God warned him about the flood. Abraham has faith uh, when he obeys God to lead his family to an unfamiliar place. Abraham even has faith to kill his son. Well, almost, right? We know how that story goes. Uh, but then uh, you have this faith that Isaac shows because Abraham has passed his promises on to him. And the faith that Jacob has as he received promises from his father Isaac. And Jacob passes on those promises to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then of course you have the faith of Moses who stands before Pharaoh and by faith leads the people out of Israel. You have Gideon who uh, by faith leads God's people into battle and to victory. You have Samson, a great warrior, a hero of the faith you may say who leads God's people into battle and into victory. Uh, you even, of course, have someone like David, who at a young age had such great faith that he stood before Goliath, trusting in and dependent upon God and God alone. And that faith carried him throughout his life. One day, of course, in which leads to having the descendant being Jesus himself. And the list can go on and on. Men and women all throughout the Bible constantly putting their faith into action. Now when I look at this list in Hebrews 11, or I think about other people in the Bible, and then I think about my own record of, or receipt of faithfulness, I realize that I don't really hold a candle to those people. Uh, that, that when I think about the stories of Abraham and of David and of Ruth and of Esther, uh, my faith doesn't even compare to those people. That in so many times in their lives and in so many different people's lives throughout Scripture, they put their life on the line as an act of faith. And on the one hand, of course, I'm thankful that I don't have to put my life on the line as an act of faith. And at the same time, I actually have it on good record that, that if I did, or in a case that I had to put my life, or I had to put a, a stop from getting into jail because of my faith in Jesus, I wouldn't confess it. Fake jail, fake jail. Okay, let me, let me rephrase here. Let me, let me tell you that story. So, I was a junior in high school, uh, and uh, every summer we went on a family uh, whitewater rafting trip with our church. And so the youth would kind of stay in one campsite, and then uh, the parents would stay in another campsite. And every night we played this game called Romans and Christians. And the Christians had to uh, kind of walk into the night, walk around the campsite, and their objective was to find five tokens that were being held by adults on the other side of the campground, but they had to do it in secret. So no lights, you're walking in the dark, and you're trying to find out. You don't know who the adult Christians are. You're trying to find them and not get caught. The Romans had one very clear and simple objective, find and arrest the Christians. So there I am, uh, running around with two other friends. We, we stayed in a group of three, and we made it kind of up and down and all around the campsite, and we found three tokens. And then there was this big field that we had to run across. It's kind of like the fields that we have uh, in the back of our, our church here. And so we have to cross this huge field. And as we make our way across, tiptoeing and then starting to run, whew, the light shone, and there was no more darkness. And so the Romans are right there, right? And they're like, hold on, hold on, stop running. And so they come over to us, and they say, what are you doing out this late? And I look at my friends, and I'm like, oh, just out for a stroll. I mean, it's a lovely night. The, the stars are shining, the moon looks pretty. I mean, it's great. And they're like, well, where are you coming from? 
Oh, the baker's house just around the corner. You know, the famous baker. And, and you know, the Romans are like, oh, yeah, the baker who makes the great bread. I'm like, yeah, that baker. And so I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to get away with this. So, so we start to walk away, and then they say, hold on. Are you Christians? Are you followers of Jesus? And I looked at my friends, and I looked back at the Romans, and I said, Jesus, who's that? I mean, who would follow that guy? What, what are you doing here, right? And the Romans looked at us, and then they took us to jail. And so we, we get back to the campsite. We're stuck in jail. And by the end of the game, there's one girl left standing, and she's got all five tokens when she comes back. And I think to myself, how in the world did you make it when you were the only one that they were looking for, and you're writing alone, and you still got all five tokens? I mean, how did all that come together? How did you not get caught? And she says to the whole group, well, no, I did get caught. And we're like, well, what happened? And she said, well, when they asked who I was or what I was doing, I told them that I was a Christian, uh, that I was a follower of Jesus, and they let me go. Now, sure, you could say that, well, Pastor, it was just a game and you were just a kid, uh, but that moment still stands out to me so pointedly because it's the first, and thanks be to God, the only time in my life, but I've actually said the words, no, I don't believe in Jesus. And sure, it was just part of a game. But if I wasn't willing to say or to live out my faith in a game, why should I believe that I would live it out if my life was really on the line? See, when I check my record, when I look at the receipt of my faithfulness, and not only in that moment, but at so many other moments in my life, I realize that it's not really pretty. Uh, that if I think about how I've lived out my faithfulness, when I check the record, it would say, well, kind of one of two things. Either I trust God in some things, but not all things, or that uh, more often than not, I'm actually not living out the faith that I claim to have. And so it's not really active. In fact, it's probably just unfaithful. And so in the midst of, of this unfaithfulness then, that, that I live out, that I act out, how do you feel about your receipt? Uh, what does your record of faithfulness look like? Uh, does it look like a life that is always, 100% of the time, confident and assured in God? You know, one of the things that I do is I tend to ask questions that I already know the answer to when I talk to you guys, uh, because I know the answer is no, that all of us here struggle with our faith, uh, that there are not 100% of the time that we are sure, that we are confident. We've had moments when we live unfaithfully, and, and that's true about these people in the Bible, too. That uh, these same people, these, these so-called heroes of the faith, they struggled with their faith. They were unfaithful too. Just, just listen to some of the things. Uh, Noah got drunk. Uh, Lot slept with his daughters. Abraham lies numerous times. Isaac and Jacob, they both lie too. Moses kills a man. Gideon falls away. Samson sells God's people out for sex. David has an affair and conspires to commit murder. And on and on it goes. That even the so-called people who are so faithful struggled with their faith and lived so unfaithfully so often in their lives. But what does that mean for me and you then? That if we look at uh, this faithful record of these people's lives and we then know that they were unfaithful, how do we even compare? We're not putting our life on the line for our faith. And so if they're struggling and they're wrestling their whole lives, uh, maybe you find yourself asking the question, well then, why have faith at all? Why have faith in the first place? If I'm just going to struggle and wrestle my entire life and never achieve the perfect faithfulness. If, if you've been there before, if you ever asked yourself that question, or maybe you're asking it now because of things going on in your life, I want to invite you to hear the words from Hebrews chapter 12. That after the writer of Hebrews lists all the faithful acts of the people of God, he brings us back in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and he says these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. 
the beauty of all the people that are mentioned in, in Hebrews 11, of all the faith that they had, of all the ways that they lived out their faith, is that it all points back to Jesus. That uh, when we look back on their lives and we read about the things that they did, about their great acts of faith, it wasn't because they were great and awesome people, it was because God is great and awesome, because God is faithful in Jesus. That God was working in their lives by the power of the Spirit that is unseen, by the presence of Jesus that is unseen. That the assurance of the things they hoped for was met over and over and over again. That uh, when they lived out in unfaithful ways, they were brought back to Jesus to repent, to confess their sin, to experience God's faithfulness again and again and again. They're pointed back to what God has always promised to do through Jesus. See, in Jesus, God promises to restore what has been broken by sin. And in Jesus, God promises to reconcile what was, what was broken and what was destroyed through sin. In Jesus, God promises to redeem what was taken from us by sin. And when we talk about redeeming, when we talk about redemption, it means that we are being bought back. That when you redeem something, you receive something in return. God redeems us through Jesus. In Jesus, God paid the price for your sin and for my sin. He paid with his life, with his death, and he rose from the dead. He poured out his blood for me and for you. Jesus' death on the cross was payment for our sin, payment for our salvation, payment for our new life, and all the promises that God has ever made to us. And as you know, when you pay for something, you usually get a receipt. You get a record where you can go back and you can see how God did it. You can see the price that God paid for me and for you. You can see the receipt of God's faithfulness. And so, uh, what does that receipt look like? Uh, where can we find that, right? Because a receipt is typically something that you can hold. So, on the one hand, uh, we've got two receipts that we experience and that we see uh, one every week, one other times, right? We, we have baptism. Baptism is a place in which God pours his water upon us and through his word, we have the receipt that God has called us by name and our identity. And then every week here in worship, uh, through the body and blood of Jesus that we receive, we have a receipt that we can receive, that we can take and eat. But God is so incredible, God is so, so wonderful in his faithfulness, that he gave us a receipt that we can carry everywhere and anywhere that we go. No, this is not a receipt from Safeway. The receipt of God's word. Uh, over 400 pages, over, over 400 feet of God's word taped together. See, uh, at the youth gathering uh, back in Houston, uh, our Bible study leaders, uh, they brought out their own receipt that they taped together. And they reminded us that uh, what this receipt does is it's a record of God's faithfulness. That on, on every single page here, you will find God's faithfulness in Jesus. And so a few weeks ago at our lock-in, I had the youth come in. And when we got here, I showed them all the pages of the Bible not taped together. And together we taped this incredible receipt. This ongoing record of faithfulness. Because in God's word, in the thing that you can carry with you, everywhere that you go, you will find Jesus on every page. Because uh, Jesus is in all things, and in him, all things hold together. So what does that mean for me and for you? Uh, well, uh, when you check the receipt of your faithfulness, when you go back and check the record, you'll find three words. Paid in full. That's what God does for me and for you in Jesus. God pays the price for your sin and for my sin. And then invites us to live out the faithfulness that Jesus has already lived. The perfect founder of our faith. So that uh, together we may run this race. 
to receive the promises that are still yet to come. So if, you, if you're feeling weak or, or when you're feeling weary, when you're feeling tired and you don't want to run anymore, check the receipt. Uh, check God's word, the record of his faithfulness to you. Let the word of God point you back to Jesus and fill you with hope. Hope in promises made, promises fulfilled, and promises that are still yet to come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue in worship, I invite the congregation to stand, and we confess our faith together. We confess together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Together, church, we join our hearts and minds now in prayer. As we pray for the church, the world, and for all of creation, trusting in God to hear us as we call. Merciful Lord, you have raised up children for Abraham from all the nations through faith in your word and promise. Bless your church on earth through our Lord Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith, that your people would be defended against the assaults and temptations of the adversary. By your Holy Spirit, help us to live into righteousness in Christ and to shine like stars in the heavens forever and ever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the gift of life here on earth, we give thanks and rejoice this day as we celebrate the birthday of Dick Getch, and we also give thanks for the birth of Alexander Thaddeus Meyer. We ask that you would continue to be with them and watch over them always. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the gifts of love and relationship, especially as we give thanks for the gift of marriage, and we celebrate with Bill and Dorothy Fristo as they celebrate their 65th anniversary, that you would continue to bless them and keep them in your love and keep us all steadfast in the love that you have for us through Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sustain all who are afflicted in any way and bless those who serve as caregivers as we pray especially for Janet Anderson, Bill Rigotti, Toby Heider, Alice Arndt, Pat Rodifer, Dick Getch, Marion Lewis, Russ Lawton, George Candler, Susie Berkheimer, Mary Carson, Finn Dunn, and all who we name before you in the petitions of our hearts, that they will be comforted and lifted up by your loving care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give peace, comfort, and hope to the loved ones of Sabatu Gebre Michael, Trey Wells, and Lauren Hellickson, as they mourn their passing from this life, and give thanks for the work of Jesus through him here on earth, and give thanks for life eternal in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send the blessings of your Holy Spirit upon the installation of Pastor Bill Harmon as president of the Southeastern District and cause this new partnership between shepherd and flock to bear the fruit of the gospel in the variety of communities they serve together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your Son has taught us to pray that your name would be hallowed and your kingdom come and for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us trusting hearts that turn to you in all joy and sorrow finding in your fatherly goodness all that we ask, seek, need, or desire. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commit all for who and for what we pray, knowing that you will hear the prayers of your people and answer us with your mercy according to your good and gracious will, providing all things that we need through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen congregation may be seated as together we continue with the gathering of our tithes and offerings. Still showing up 
Together, church, as we confess our sins, I invite you to stand as you are able. And in scripture, God tells us that when we have our sin, we confess it to him. And that he is faithful and just and forgives all of our sins and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Together, then, we confess before God as we seek his mercy and his forgiveness. God, our maker and redeemer, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We come for refuge to your infinite mercy. 
you have given your only Son to die for us. Have mercy on us, and for his sake, forgive us all our sin. By your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and your will, and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. By God's grace, through the death and resurrection of his son, through his faithfulness shown to Jesus through you, he forgives you of all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night before he gave his life for us, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. And in the same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he blessed it and gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Taught by our Lord together, we pray the family prayer of his church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, your sins are forgiven. Come taste and see that the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Welcome to the table of the Lord.
bring us back again. For your name is great and your heart is grace. to stand as you are able for prayer. The eating of Christ's body and the drinking of his blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace until the day of everlasting life. Depart in his peace. Amen. We pray. Almighty and gracious God, Lord, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us through this gift of life and faithfulness. And Lord, we ask that it strengthen us in our relationship towards you and in our love towards one another. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people agreed and said together. Amen and receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.
to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Where I belong And Lord 